My name is Brechna and I'm with Haymarket Books. We're incredibly excited to be hosting this discussion on the central place of Palestine in socialist organizing and the role of socialism in the struggle for Palestine. And we feel very lucky to have you all joining us from around the world. Thank you so much to our brilliant speakers as well. We're very grateful for your time. This discussion is linked to one of our recently published works, Palestine, a Socialist Introduction. You can buy the book directly from Haymarket's website and viewers based in the UK can buy it from bookshop.org. I'd now like to introduce our speakers. Um, Ilan Pape is a historian and the best-selling author of The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine and The Israel-Palestine Question. Sumaya Awad is a Palestinian writer and socialist organizer based in New York City. Her writings focus on Palestine, anti-imperialism, Islamophobia, and immigration, and have been featured in The Feminist Wire, In These Times, and Jacobin, among others. She is currently Director of Strategy at the Adala Justice Project. Sumaya is the co-editor of Palestine, a Socialist Introduction. Brian Bean is a Chicago-based socialist activist, writer, and speaker originally from North Carolina. He is one of the founding editors of Rampant Magazine. His work has been published in Jacobin, Socialist Worker, Red Flag, International Viewpoint, among others. He is also a co-editor of Palestine, a Socialist Introduction. Yara Hawari is a Palestinian writer and political commentator. She completed her PhD in Middle East politics at the University of Exeter, where her research focused on oral history and indigenous studies. She currently works as a senior analyst at Al Shabaka, a Palestinian think tank. Her first book, The Stone House, is forthcoming with Hajar Press. Thank you all again for joining us today. Um, we'll now head over to Ilan, who will be chairing this discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Rekha. Thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, uh, to be hosting this important uh, event. And uh, I thank the organizers for trusting me with uh, chairing this uh, uh, panel with three excellent uh, participants. Uh, in the 1970s, associating the struggle for the liberation of Palestine with uh, the left was very common and prevalent. The left played uh, a very important role in the ongoing struggles against imperialism and against the final residues of colonialism in Asia and Africa, and also challenged the power of capitalism in the left, in the West. The left was also a very important actor in the Palestinian liberation movement. Uh, these past international prestige and networking are today nostalgically uh, uh, remembered or recalled either as bygones never to return or more hopefully as a voice, as a voice from uh, a formative inspirational period that can hopefully re-energize the struggle for freedom and justice in Palestine, in Palestine and, and beyond. The crisis in the Palestinian liberation movement began with the Israeli assault on Beirut in 1982 and culminated probably 10 years later with the Oslo Agreement. The Palestinian left was always very clear and lucid about the vision of a democratic and secular state in Palestine as the end game of any struggle, but it also had been uh, at the crossroads like other Palestinian movements after Oslo. Part of the left joined the Fatah in accepting the two-state solution and the logic of Oslo, and another part joined the, those who opposed Oslo, refusing to succumb to the new Israeli tactics of dispossession uh, under the international umbrella of the peace process and remained loyal to the one secular democratic state vision. 
Uh, for a moment, it seemed as if the left, both in Palestine and in the world, was re-energized in 2008 in the West and in 2011 in the Arab world when Matthew's movements protested against the brutal neoliberal systems in the West and the authoritarian regimes in the Arab world. In both cases, the call for social justice, equality, uh, fused with the struggle for human and civil rights. This incredible revolutionary energy was not easily channeled into the traditional tools the left used to offer in the past for successful revolutions, organizations, unions, parties, tools utilized effectively, ironically, by the political Islamic resistance to Zionism and imperialism. A hugely pro-Palestinian uh, uh, global civil society based on intersectional movement of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle has recently united um, uh, against, uh, has recently united with indigenous uh, uh, struggles against settler colonialism, with campaigns of workers against neo capitalism, and the fight of minorities against racism, misogynism, and homophobia. This kind of activism and global impulse against injustice might be a good moment to ponder about the role of the left in the struggle for Palestine and the role of Palestine in the struggle of the left. Our discussion is triggered by an excellent book that was already mentioned, published by Haymarket, Palestine, a Socialist Introduction, edited by uh, two of our panelists, Sumaya Awad and Brian uh, uh, Bean. Uh, uh, this is a collection of 10, uh, if I remember correctly, 10 chapters that engage poignantly and incisively with the past and possible future role of the left in the struggle for justice in Palestine. Uh, 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 from critical analysis of organizational matters to the very complex issues of gender and secularism, this book is a must read for anyone whose socialism has brought them to care and act on behalf of Palestine and the Palestinians. As a left, we are at the crucial juncture of strategic contemplation in general and on Palestine in particular. And I think this book offers ways forward that can re-energize the left as a robust alliance of identification and solidarity for the sake of the liberation of Palestine, as well as of that of all the oppressed workers and peoples around the globe. Uh, we have, as, as we ha already heard, we have three wonderful panelists uh, uh, to help us do this. Uh, two of the authors and uh, uh, Dr. Yara Hawari uh, from Ramallah. From our speakers, we would hear about their assessments of the left and Palestine in the age of Trump. With the context of our discussion would be how to view these, how, how do we view the questions of elections on both sides of the green line? And we'll also ask them about the views about intersectionality and international solidarity. Uh, the order of things would be in the following manner. I will ask each of the participant, uh, participants the same question. So I, I won't repeat the same question three times. I will ask it only once, but there will be three different, different or, or complementary answers to, to the same question. Uh, we have altogether three major questions. And uh, after that round of discussion, if there's time, and I hope there will be time, we will open it up uh, to uh, the audience. Uh, so we are trying to, to ask our panelists about the central place of Palestine in socialist organization uh, and the role of socialism in the struggle uh, to, uh, uh, to free Palestine. So my first question, and uh, the order of thing would be that, uh, uh, for the first question, Sumaya would answer first, Brian would answer second, and Yara uh, would answer uh, last but not least. Um, uh, the first question is anti uh, is about your views about anti capitalism during the Trump presidency. Uh, if you can talk about the impact of the Trump presidency on the Palestinian cause, with a particular focus on normalization between Israel. Uh, and the Gulf countries, uh, uh, the growing support for socialism in the United States, and uh, false hope in the Biden administration. So these are all pointers to what happened in America during uh, the time of Trump, especially since 2016, 
And of course, what happened after the election of 2020 with relations to Palestine and the left. So, Sumaya, uh, if you would be kind enough to, to be the first, and then we'll move to, to Brian and then Yara. Great, thank you so much, um, Ilan, and uh, to Haymarket and the others for organizing this. It's it's a great honor to speak alongside you all, but especially Yara, so I'm really glad to be here. I actually want to, um, I'm going to briefly talk about Trump, but then I actually want to go backwards in time a little bit. I think that everything that happened under Trump, um, he, ex he uh, exceeded, I think, or expedited the timeline of what successive U.S. administrations have been trying to do um, and, and would have done regardless, um, and did so um, in some ways in a much easier way than a Democratic administration would have been able to because he was able to just push things through um, with, uh, with little fear of, of repercussions. But I think that everything that Trump did, um, the a Democratic administration um, would have wanted done and is certainly reaping the benefits of it. Of course, there are certain things that he did that maybe that's not the case, but I think generally the policy was not an anomaly in what we've seen for decades from the United States. Um, but one thing that I think it did cement and what the Abraham Accords certainly cement is um, a process that has been ongoing um, of the U.S. trying to create, and in many ways succeeding, uh, a single economic zone in the Middle East um, where capital flows freely, um, where uh, markets are essentially deregulated, and where Adam Hania has described it as they have Israel in the East, uh, sorry, in the West, and the GCC in the East, um, as sort of like the poles of capital that are working together. And I actually want to take us back to 2007, which um, is right after the elections that happened, and we'll get into that later. But after that, the Palestinian Authority um, introduced, of course, with the help of the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, this uh, development plan, the PRDP, I believe, the Palestinian Reform and Development Plan. And I could talk about this for an hour, and I won't. But essentially what it did was it was a way to attract foreign capital and investments into Palestine and relied very heavily on um, uh, uh, cementing neoliberalism. So uh, the, the plan stipulated, among many other things, uh, privatization. A lot of key sectors were privatized um, and a lot of services as a result were private, like, you know, services that, that people were used to getting became privatized and largely um, by Israeli corporations. Um, uh, it stipulated that the PA had to cut back the public sector by 21%. Um, this is jobs. Salaries had to decrease over a period of time. And uh, this new debt system was entrenched that essentially, and many have already said this, but essentially made the PA the debt collectors for um, the occupying power. And this was followed by, um, across the region, not just in Palestine, this was followed by the implementation of free trade agreements um, and of uh, QIZs, Qualified Industrial Zones. And, um, you know, there's a lot to unpack from what these mean, but two important things to take from it is, one, it meant that there were these large economic zones that um, used very cheap Palestinian labor, and in Jordan and Egypt, also Jordanian and Egyptian labor, um, and, and migrant workers as well, but relied on this cheap labor where these workers were not given any rights, you know, nothing was regulated, and it all was based on going through um, uh, uh, the Israeli surveillance apparatus, right? So like to work in these zones, even though some of them were in the West Bank, you had to go through um, um, uh, screenings and, and all sorts of, of, of filters. Um, and it created a whole class of Palestinian workers that was reliant on this and reliant on the PA and, its, um, and all the international aid that was funneled through the Palestinian Authority. Um, what it also did at this time is it uh, allowed the GCC countries to um, have a much stronger position uh, in the Arab world and particularly in relation to Palestine in terms of um, aid and investments. So shortly after this development program um, was introduced in 2007, there was a big conference in Ramallah um, that brought in uh, members of the GCC states, um, members of the Israeli government, the PA, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and then, and this is important, um, Palestinian uh, elites and very wealthy Palestinians around the world 
attracting them to come to this conference um, as a sort of way to say, hey, look, the West Bank is stable. You can invest here now. Like this is this is where you want to invest. And all of this was done under the facade of this is what self-determination looks like. This is what economic self-determination is. This is what sovereignty looks like. Um, and that's how the PA sold it, right? And that's how Arab states sold it, because that was how they could get away with doing this when their local populations were uh, very anti-normalization. And of course, Israel was there the whole time and and this they're profiting from it and continue to. Um, now, at the same time, what all of this did for the United States, and, and this was in many ways um, a, a big part of the U.S.'s plan in the region, and I would say a lot of this was thwarted, at least to some extent, by the Arab Spring. Um, but ultimately, what they wanted to do is they wanted to create, um, they wanted to, ha- they wanted to exert independent control over um, the Middle East and um, its its economic place in in the global order. And even though today. Um, the U.S. does not rely on oil in the same way that it did in the past. Um, it has its own oil reserves, et cetera. It still wants to maintain um, a, a presence in, in like the global oil market, but also, crucially, it's now dependent on surveillance and arms and weaponry. And Israel and the GCC are, of course, at the forefront of, of all of this. Um, the last thing I'll say, because I think I'm running out of time, um, is that all of this is the backdrop of um, the Abraham Accords and what we're seeing now. And so in many ways, it's not a surprise at all. Um, and, and I think most people know this, but it's, it should be alarming in that what it sets forth is more of these open normalization agreements um, that are public. And starting with the UAE and Bahrain, of course, was, um, was key. Uh, for the UAE in particular, there is no indigenous working class. There's no one that's going to rise up against what the government is doing. Bahrain is a little bit different. But with the might of the Saudi military behind it, it's I mean, we've seen the repression that's happened in Bahrain. So it's unlikely that there's going to be a a blowback, at least anytime soon. And I think that's part of the reason why the agreement went through. Um, But also crucially, that it shows how the role of Israel in the in the region is really key and that this is all part of the plan to integrate and to uh, meld together uh, Israeli capital and Arab capital um, against the wishes of all of these indigenous, you know, workers, populations and others um, in in the region, um, and certainly as a way to fragment and depoliticize and demobilize um, any sort of Palestinian movement that could rise against this, because it entrenches, um, it entrenches all the fragmentations that we're already seeing, right, geographical, or physical rather, Gaza, the West Bank, 48, but also um, within the West Bank, the rungs, the class that exists, right, The, the Palestinian elite, versus the workers, the refugees, um, et cetera. And, and I'm running out of time. So I'm going to, I'll just end by saying, I think what we're expecting under Biden is that very little will change. We saw that they reinstated UNRWA, like, okay, and then what? Um, but I don't think that there's going to be any sort of drastic change because it's a Biden administration. And I think Biden and everyone he's appointed um, has, has certainly made that, made that to be the case. Thank you very much, uh, Sumaya. Brian, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ilan, and thanks uh, other panelists and people listening. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump off and underline some of the stuff that Sumaya was talking about as far as how the Trump's egregiousness and sort of the ugliness and violence that he sort of pushed forward actually um, fits in a continuum of the U.S. strategy in the region that's existed for decades. I mean, normalization began really in the 70s with Egypt and then with Jordan in the 90s. And so what we've seen is just an extenuation and deepening of the general palace, the general policy, which Samaya described, of creating a single economic zone in the region that makes business very profitable for capital. Um, and the consequences of that is that uh, a more atomization, more isolation for the Palestinian people, and then also the connection with a sort of a new nascent Palestinian capitalist class with the, their, their, their colonial masters, um, if you will. And that has ramifications for the resistance um, a- as it is. Um, and I think that that's an important thing just to underline and talk about again and again, because that kind of charts the course that we're going to see with Biden, which is the fact that this is a, a, a um, trajectory that is going to continue. Um, you know, he and Secretary of State 
uh, Blinken have said not just that they're not going to change the normalization, but they have praised it. They see that something positive that Trump has done. They're not going to move the capital. They are opposing the ICC investigation into Israel. Uh, he's proposing a military budget bigger than that of Trump. Um, and even just his general stance on on refugees, the Washington Post today um, found that the uh, the Biden ha has let less refugees into the country than even Trump did in his final year. And so there's a sort of a an a, a escalation, I think, of the the policy of of Biden, which is to put the United States back at the the sort of head of the world table, which of course is really bad for the world's working people and is really bad for Palestinians. And so I think sort of the the challenge is how we sort of build a new movement that I think is focused on those things and the importance of socialism in that. Um, in that the what has driven this policy for decades that has been sped up under Trump is the drive to make um, uh, the region profitable for capitalists. And so the resistance against that has to go against capitalism. So resistance both in the region and our own resistance in the, the countries of the West against our governments have to see breaking the logic of capitalism and the logic of imperialism as necessary to achieve that liberation. Oh. Work. Not holding. We can. Ilana can go ahead if that works. Why? But my. So you are. The floor is yours. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Ilan, and um, thanks to my um, other panelists. You know, a lot has already been said. I, I think the, the focus on Trump and the, the damage he did for the Palestinian struggle can obscure the reality of decades of detrimental US policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. You know, Trump was cruder, more vulgar, uh, and perhaps, you know, a more obvious example of the complete disregard for, for Palestinian rights and aspirations for sovereignty. But the danger with him out of office is this glorification of a new administration um, and people letting their guard down. And that's something that I'm concerned about when in reality, systematically, structurally, nothing you know has changed. Israel remains this outpost for US imperialist and capitalist interests. And I think we're seeing you know a natural trajectory of the Israeli settler colonial project as it moves to increase its legitimacy. The normalization agreements with the GCC countries was, you know, in reality was this motley crew of human rights abusing, warmongering regimes signing agreements of bilateral relations in exchange for, for weapons and money. Uh, and as Brian mentioned, this this recognition that these sort of normalization happened, happened decades ago, these relations with Israel have been going on for decades. You know, the UAE, Saudi Arabia have been increasingly having meetings with Israeli officials and experts, um, especially regarding security technologies that would be used in their countries to spy on political opposition, opposition um, and activists. Um, you know, they've also long been sharing security information. Uh, we've seen also more recently increased social media engagement through spe spe specific pages that promote relations between Israel and the Gulf. Um, and so the, the latest political maneuver of so-called normalization has just largely officialized uh, what was already long-standing relationships. And I think it would be limited to, to see these agreements as simply undermining the, the Palestinian struggle and expanding capital. I think it's very much also re regional maneuvering. And many pundits have noted that this, you know, is an attempt by the US and Israel to counter the, the threat of Iran by creating a block of allied countries. Um, but there's also, you know, really another really worrying side to these agreements. You know, all of these countries, as I mentioned, are serious human rights abusers of the populations that they govern over. You know, from Bahrain, which has consistently put down pro-democracy uprisings, to the UAE, which has, you know, frequently imprisons and deports political opponents and, and critics. 
And so I think it's really no wonder that these regimes have allied themselves with Israel, which has maintained, you know, for over seven decades, an incredibly violent settler colonial regime over the Palestinian people. It's also the largest export of arms per capita in the world, um, and, you know, and it frequently offers out its services to train other security forces in crushing uh, dissent all the way from India to the US. Um, and, and indeed, I think the UAE, Bahrain, others are, are no doubt expecting to benefit from the fact that Israel is an expert in violating human rights and creating the technologies and weapons uh, for those violations. Um, and I also want to go, you know, a bit back uh, in history and, and, and think about, you know, Palestine's central place in leftist organizing, particularly um, when the Palestinian movement was framed as an anti-colonial movement and a struggle against Zionist imperialism. We know in the 60s and 70s, Ilan, as you mentioned, um, you know, the PLO primarily modeled itself, uh, its agendas, its goals, its tactics on the Algerian National Liberation Front, which triumphed over French settlers. Um, and the PLO saw, you know, similar structures of invasion. Uh, they sought camaraderie and expertise from Algerian leaders. Um, and, and indeed, after liberation uh, from French settler colonialism, Algeria became this place for revolutionaries all around the world. And this was a period that very much embodied the spirit of internationalism and importantly, anti-colonial struggle uh, was at the heart of it. And Palestine was a part of that moment in history. But a lot has changed since then. And these revolutionary and socialist connections have weakened for, for many reasons. Uh, one of which, uh, not least, it was the onset of neoliberalism and policies of of uh, de-development across the world, which, you know, among many things, insisted on the depoliticization of struggles. And with specificity to Palestine, that there was this distinct narrative shift that began this process of uh, depoliticization and the breaking of internationalist ties. And it and it began in the late eighties, but it was. It was probably best epitomized by the Oslo Accords um, of the early 1990s, you know, that famous peace agreement uh, where Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli prime minister, and PLO chairman Arafat shook hands on the White House lawn flanked by a very smug looking uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, and, the, and these accords framed the Israeli settler colonial project as an issue of two conflicting national movements that would find peace within a two-state paradigm. And, and sure enough, this, this remains to be <clears throat> a very dominant narrative uh, that, you know, both sides need to put down their arms and talk to one another. Um, so what we saw was a revolutionary movement shift its discourse and policies from, from liberation and anti-colonialism to that of state building in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Uh, and we also saw Palestine shrunk down to, to not only the West Bank and Gaza, but certain parts of those occupied um, uh, territories. Um, uh, and later, as, uh, in 2008, as Samaya uh, outlined, we would see the Palestinian Authority adopt a new economic program, the, the Palestinian Reform and Development Plan. Um, and this basically embraced neoliberalism, you know, in other words, a private sector driven economy, a focus on attracting foreign investment and a reduction in, in, in public spe spending. Um, and the, the national discourse in Palestine shifted from uh, one of collective liberation uh, to one of individual success and capital gain. And this coupled with increasingly authoritarian reg regime has rendered, you know, the so-called Palestinian leadership as, as complicit with the oppression of their people, um, as, similar to so many other regimes of colonized uh, peoples. And, and I've mentioned all of this because I think it's important to remember the revolutionary roots of the Palestinian struggle and that Palestine historically and naturally was part of an internationalist global movement that embraced anti-colonial and anti-capitalist politics. Um, and this has to be remembered uh, in spite of the current political shifts and in spite of what the current Palestinian leadership um, has adopted in terms of their discourse. Thank you very much, Yara. Um, for the second question, uh, maybe you can uh, answer it first and then we'll move to Brian and Sumaya. Uh, part of the answer, I think you already hinted in uh, the last uh, bit of your uh, uh, analysis, but I will mention the question anyway. Uh, and this has to do with the, uh, the question of elections, both in Israel and in the uh, 
occupy the West Bank, the PA uh, elections. Um, are they important? Uh, can they be viewed uh, as an opportunity for uh, supporting progressive policies? For instance, can, can the elections help bridging the gap of the socioeconomic gap in the society, even if they don't contribute directly to liberation and so on? Uh, which, as, as we know, some Palestinians who uh, support the elections on both sides of the Green Line would claim that through the elections you can deal with the problem of violence in the Israeli, in, in, among uh, the Palestinian uh, community inside Israel, that is criminal violence, uh, and that you can maybe push a reform, a more, more kind of a socialist uh, or social democratic agenda through the Palestinian elections, even if those elections are not contributing to national uh, liberation. So maybe this time we'll start with Yara, we'll move to Brian, and Sumaya, you, you will conclude the, the answer uh, to this question. Uh, Yara, please. Yeah, thanks, Ilan. I mean, I guess the short answer to, to, to that question, you know, <laughs> elections <laughs> are important, um, is both yes and no. Right. So I'll, I'll start with the latter. You know, the Israeli elections, I personally don't believe are hugely important for Palestinians um, across the Green Line uh, or the so-called Green Line, um, because Israeli politics vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians is quite consistent across the, the mainstream political spectrum. And I think this was aptly demonstrated with the, you know, the, the main opposition to Netanyahu across the so many elections that we've had, uh, who was Benny Gantz, an IDF general who used images of the 2014 bombardment of Gaza and his own personal war crimes in, uh, in Gaza to rally the, his electorate. You know, so we see that the issue isn't Netanyahu, as many liberal pundits might have us believe, but rather the foundational constitution of the Israeli state, which is based on settler dominance and the exclusion and erasure of indigenous Palestinians. So whilst, you know, we can beg for scraps at the master's table and hope for, you know, a few, uh, 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 a few benefits here and there, I think overall um, um, Israeli elections are, are not so important. Now, the, the Palestinian elections, which I should, you know, clarify, um, are supposed to be actually a series of elections, the, the Palestinian mm. Legislative Council, the PLC elections, which are supposed to happen at the end of May, then um, followed by the presidential elections, and then um, apparently the Palestinian National Assembly elections. Um, now, it's yet to be seen if uh, any of these will go ahead. In, in fact, there's uh, increasing signs that they might not happen. Um, but regardless of whether they do or don't, I also don't think that these are so important for the Palestinian struggle for liberation. And the reason being is that elections you know, are really just a technical procedure and they cannot be um, in any way interchangeable with democracy. You know, they can take place um, not only in democracies, but also in countries where de de democratic characteristics are lacking or completely absent. And Palestine at the moment is in the latter category. You know, public support for Fatah in the West Bank and Hamas and Gaza is waning. They don't have popular mandates. They're maintaining their grip um, over these territories through authoritarianism and corruption. Um, and political opposition uh, has long been uh, repressed in both uh, the West Bank and Gaza. The authorities um, in both territories regularly arrest journalists, activists, you know, and people who question their actions or reveal information about, you know, corruption. Um, and the Israeli regime also plays a big role in this political oppress oppression by incarcerating thousands of uh, Palestinians for political crimes um, and outlawing most uh, Palestinian uh, political activity. You know, indeed, the uh, Israeli military prisons are full of Palestinian leftists, and that's not by coincidence, that's been by design. And the result has been that the cementing of a one-party system in, in both territories and really a depoliticization of um, Palestinian society. So I, I think elections would, you know, achieve 
really little more than propping up a status quo that doesn't allow for democratic space in a system that doesn't really seek to produce a democratic and representative leadership. Now, where we might see an, see an opportunity if we are, you know, um, desperate for something positive, I mean, I think the, the elections could be an opportunity uh, to reveal the reality of the situation. And that is in Israel that the electorate is massively right wing, um, and dismissive and even violent in its outlook towards Palestinians. Uh, and that in the West Bank and Gaza, there isn't a democratic space, that the oppressive and authoritarian regime uh, authorities are simply looking for a way to legitimize their grip over the population through a veneer of democratic practice. And so I think if we're really clutching at straws and want to find something positive to say, we could say that elections in both cases opens up a space to talk about why elections um, in this case is not what is needed. Okay, thank you, Yara. Uh, Brian, what is your view on this question? Well, I agree with uh, both Yara's short answers and long answers. Um, <laughs> so I think that was that was well said. Um, I think that um, I think if there's if there's one other possible positive for the elections uh, in in Palestine, it would be um, the rapprochement between Fatah and Hamas. I think that the 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 breaking and the atomization of Gaza from the West Bank is something that um, has set the struggle back. Um, at the same time, I think that in both of those places, uh, the they have not sort of worked to further the struggle, to deepen the grassroots movements, and have actually sort of clamped down it in the way that Yara has described. Um, and so I definitely sort of share the perspective that I think that without really trying to to figure out some way to change the status quo, it just kind of rearranges the death chairs, that it just sort of reconstructs uh, the, the status quo as it is and will be a continuance. And I think the continuance fits in the context of this trajectory that we previously described and that that won't be changed. And so I think part of the calculus about why the elections are happening are important as well. I've heard some commentators talk about how one of the things driving the elections in Palestine is uh, a calculus that Biden will somehow be a better partner to restart negotiations um, than Trump was. Um, and so if we can just unite the, the Palestinian political factions, we can have one spokesperson who will be able to better deal with the United States. And I think to that, it's, it gets to the illusions of the stuff we talked about previously, where if we understand the trajectory of Oslo and, and what is going on, to have a better uh, uh, negotiator who is gets the stamp of an election with the Palestinian people to be able to negotiate a peace process that's only meant, um, you know, the 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 interconnection of settler colonialism with whatever um, vestiges of the Palestinian liberation movement exists. That's not a way forward. And so I think to sort of return to maybe you know more futile negotiations that are infinitely deferred status issues and a peace process that's made the PA managers of a settler colonial occupation isn't going to sort of make anything uh, sort of move forward. I think the other uh, sort of uh, context is important to think about the elections is I think that also this is happening alongside of something we also talked about before, which is the normalization. And so the normalization has meant that at the same time that there's more of an interconnection with uh, a, a new Palestinian capitalist class, there's also more isolation of the liberation movement because many of the, the Gulf states and regional states who were, you know, financial and political backers, even if it's sort of halfway and, and duplicitous, um, are being more interconnected with the, the U.S. sphere of influence and with Israel. And so I think that the, the Palestinian movement is also feeling a little more isolated from some of the other folks that they would sort of consider allies. And so driving to kind of unite the, the factions is something that puts it forward. So it's a marker of isolation. I think grasping at straws of the Biden calculus and would do little to try to upset the status quo of the peace process of Oslo that uh, the other panelists have described quite well. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Sumaya, your your input on this. Thanks. Um, a lot has, has been said. Um, I guess two things I'll add is that I think the one like one of the, the, the biggest red flags that I think we should all be looking for is uh, regardless of whether or not the elections happen, um, is what uh, factions that do have power. So PA and iterations of the PA um, that will be searching for a way uh, to get another sort of economic plan in place um, going forward. Um, and I think that in particular, given, well, one, you know, the, the ongoing pandemic, 
but also everything that we've laid out about what ends up happening when these types of reforms are set in place um, is, is really cause for concern. And I think one of the concerns I have and that many have pointed out is that, you know, should these elections happen, um, one question we have to reckon with is what will happen when the results, regardless of, you know, who wins, um, are used by various parties to, um, to uh, entrench their legitimacy, regardless of whether or not they win. Um, and sort of like, how will that be used to, uh, to buy and, um, and or placate um, um, different sections of the Palestinian population, all the while, for the majority of Palestinians, um, you know, poverty is going up, unemployment is going up, um, what little rights existed don't exist anymore. Um, and this is not just in Palestine, right, but it's across the region, like Palestinians in Lebanon, Palestinians in Jordan, et cetera, um, that have to be viewed from the same from the same perspective, all the while there is this rung of elite Palestinians that is that has a lot to gain, like historically and right now from ongoing negotiations. Like they literally benefit from prolonging these these so-called peace negotiations. Um, and uh, and and you know yes they're Palestinian yes maybe sometimes they can't travel or do this or that but the reality is they live a completely different life from the majority of Palestinians um, and it's not it's not in their best material interest. Um, for things to move forward in a way that is um, that is couched in or rooted in a, a true Palestinian liberation movement, like the ones that did exist in the past and that Yara spoke about earlier. That does not exist today. There is no Palestinian liberation movement in the way that it existed back then. And I think that's just, that's the reality, right? It's unfortunate, but it's true. And none of these alternatives that, that exist um, um, are actually rooted in, in real struggle and don't have a base in, in like the majority of Palestinian workers, Palestinian refugees. And when it comes to Israel, I would say it's the same, but but like the opposite. Basically in, in Israel, it's like increasingly right-wing, which is a lot to say in Israel because it's always been right-wing. So what does it even mean to say increasingly right-wing, but like increasingly openly violent with no, no desire to even um, have a brand Israel approach to things in the way that they did in like 2010, 2012. Um, and uh, and all of the, the you know the unions the the different electoral parties um, um, hold very right wing views um, and increasingly so and don't have any sort of support in in whatever labor um, labor forces exist in the ground like there is no Israeli working class that is looking to change things that has any power whatsoever and what small iterations of of anti Zionist formations have no power. They have absolutely no power and um, um, will not be able to change the circumstances um, at all. And so I think what 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 I'm trying to say is it's very bleak to assume anything of the elections, um, you know, and if they happen in the first place. But one thing to think about is how do we use whatever results come up um, towards building uh, an actual national liberation movement on, on, on the ground if one can exist down the line. Thank you, Sumaya. Uh, Brian, maybe you'll take the first, uh, you'll, you'll answer first the, the last question, if that's okay. I know I surprised you, you thought you'd be number two, but I want to make sure that you're on your toes. Um, given uh, what Sumaya said about uh, uh, the lack of uh, a proper liberation movement and the imbalance of power uh, on the ground, we should ask ourselves, people on the left, of course, uh, what can we do then to connect socioeconomic movements of protest and revolutionary movements to the struggle against the occupation within Palestine and the colonization of Palestine? And how do we connect such movements uh, on the ground in Palestine with the, with the international solidarity movement uh, and growing support for uh, a more uh, a socialist kind of policies in the wake of COVID-19? Or in a way, how do we reignite, as Yara mentioned, and I mentioned in my introduction, the kind of solidarity uh, impulse and um, energy that we had in the 1970s? So maybe you, you'll uh, give us a, your view and then we'll move to uh, Sumaya and Yara will round up uh, our discussion. Okay. Thanks for uh, keeping me on my toes. It's good. Good exercise. <laughs> um, I think um, I think there's two answers to the question. Uh, I think the first is how do we uh, kind of 
reinvent some of the stuff that Elon, you were talking about in the introduction, which sort of in the previous waves of left ascension, uh, the question of anti-imperialism was a center, central core, and something that was that was uh, present and sort of fought about um, uh, sort of widely. Uh, and I think that in the United States, especially we have sort of a new socialist movement. You know, we have DSA is now the probably the largest socialist organization that the United States has ever seen. Um, and the question is like, what will the contours and the content of that new socialist movement be? And I think that this is the, the opportunity that we need to sort of really sort of fully grasp. And it's how we um, integrate a fight around imperialism as being sort of a like essential element of that new socialist movement, and that new socialist radicalization. Um, and so I think that the, the simple answer to that is particularly sort of in the West, just ensuring that politically that we um, integrate and include um, uh, fighting against imperialism, uh, fighting against the, the massive expanse of U.S. militarism uh, internationally and internally, um, and the, the fight for refugees and sort of uh, against borders as being something that is taken up with as much gusto as uh, uh, sort of uh, bread and butter demands such as Medicare for all and the Green mm -hmm. New Deal. I think that it should be trying to sort of bring up the notion of combating imperialism and, 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 and sort of the, the military war machine as being as important for the, the new socialist movement to sort of put on sort of the, the lead sort of banner, if you will, uh, of the struggle. I think that, I think it's the short answer, but really the essential answer to that. I think the other answer to that to that question is um, sort of stepping sideways to uh, sort of the, the the Arab Spring, and so also when we think about what you you, know, you said to reignite, I think things have ignited independent uh, of the left. We saw that in 2011 uh, with the, the the sort of explosions around the region. I think we saw things reignite in 2019 when you saw kind of a second wave of the Arab Spring uh, erupt in Sudan and Algeria and Lebanon and Iraq that also wasn't just constrained to the, the, the Middle East region, but uh, popped off in Hong Kong, uh, all across Latin America and Haiti and sort of places like that. So you see sort of a revolt against the status quo, against capitalism as being something that people are taking up. Um, and I think sort of our question politically is the left is also uh, how we can bring back that same sense of internationalism as being a key component of the struggle. It's like Yara was mentioning before about how the internationalism of the anti-colonial movement was something that was connected to the Palestinian cause. I think we need to sort of bring that back uh, to sort of really sort of see and champion these struggles from below, these eruptive, riotous uh, uprisings as being not just ancillary, but like the key uh, engines of social change. And that we see the socialist movement as embracing those, standing in solidarity, trying to reproduce them, participating in them where they are. And so I think that that sort of uh, uh, grasping of socialism, of struggle from below, of internationalism as being a core political project tied with just, I think, the, the slow, patient, but um, uh, important task of ensuring that anti-imperialist project and politics are central in the rebuilding of a new socialist movement in this country and internationally. Thank you very much. And Yara, please take us to towards the future. Sumaya, do you want to go first? Oh, Sumaya, sorry, sorry, Sumaya. I, I, I don't mind, sorry. Okay. Um, no, no, Sumaya, please, please go. Yeah, sorry, I forgot. You see, I I put Brian number one as the first uh, answer, so it con didn't confuse him. It confused me. So, so the floor is yours, Sumaya. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah it's okay. Um. Thanks for that, Brian. I think that I think the, the for me the starting point is that there hasn't really existed a left, um, certainly in the U.S. I'll just focus on the U.S. Um, in a long time. Like what we're seeing is is sort of like a, a reignition of something that hadn't existed since yes the 70s. Um, and I think that you know sure there were like there were some movements here and there, but there was never really like a robust left fighting for something. And I think we're starting to see that happening right now. And I definitely think DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, is is um, one very, very, very important example of that in the U.S. Um, it's, it's very, very uh, quickly growing. It has roots in the grassroots, but also in the electoral sphere. Um, it's had some uh, major wins. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, figuring out what to do when you have so many members and so little time 
um, in in the the world's uh, strongest uh, military power currently. I think that uh, Palestine is part of this increasingly, yes. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done um, and work to be undone from the last 30 years of relegating Palestine into the sphere of humanitarian work. Um, I think that has been something that uh, has really depoliticized what it means to stand in solidarity with Palestinians um, and has also isolated Palestine from the from regional struggles, at least from the West looking in. It's made it so you can talk about Palestine without having to touch anything else that's happening in the Middle East um, and without having to really think about the role of U.S. empire in the Middle East, um, uh, the flow of capital, the economics behind all of this and why it's happening in the first place. And so it's become all about humanitarianism and all about taking a moral and ethical stance which is, yes, great, you know, we can all be morally and ethically good and, you know, we're against people dying, fine. But that's not actually going to change what's going on um, on the ground in Palestine. And it's certainly not like a, a sustainable solution. It doesn't give you something concrete to shift material reality on the ground. And I think what we're seeing now with this new uh, socialist movement is this, um, is a desire and a new um, uh, commitment to understanding the ways in which we can have uh, a material effect on this and specifically in the United States, which is, you know, Israel's largest funder um, and political backer um, and has a lot at stake. The U.S. has a lot at stake in maintaining Israel's occupation, um, a lot of geopolitical and and um, uh, financial um, factors that it needs to think about uh, when it comes to Israel. So I think that's the first thing, and, and, and I think something positive about what's what's changing in the U.S. as, as this shift from humanitarian to political is, is gaining ground. Um, I think the other thing um, that should be at least at the, at the center of uh, any movement for Palestine in the U.S. and any anti-imperialist movement is to think about um, uh, the role of cutting U.S. funding to Israel. Um, and I think that it, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to view this, but obviously BDS is is a prime example. And everything I laid out at the beginning, and that Yada also spoke about in terms of um, um, the Palestinian economy and like what Oslo did and privatization. Um, I think all of this comes down to uh, why BDS is so important, or why boycotts in general um, uh, on Israel are really really important. Because it's it's about stopping its ability to reproduce its structures, right? Like its material ability to reproduce its structures, and it's also, I think, um, really uncovering the reality of um, uh, the relationship between Israeli capital and Arab capital right now, especially with the Abraham Accords and more of these deals, and the fact that you know Jordan and Egypt have all these economic deals with Israel that aren't really talked about that much, um, and that both countries try to keep under the rug, or certainly that's the case with Jordan. So I think that uh, focusing on ending U.S. funding um, and making that a, a, a really primary pillar of the, the movement in the U.S., this growing socialist movement, and connecting it to all sorts of other things is um, is really key. And, and the last thing I'll just end by talking about is that I think as we approach all of this, keeping in mind that what the U.S. has been steadily doing and what it's 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 going to be doing more of in the coming decade is moving away from... Um, and Anand Gopal has a great interview in Jacobin about this, but it's, it's going to be less about, hey, let's have troops on the ground in the Middle East. And it's going to be more about how do we use our influence, political and financial, um, in the region to ensure that our interests are, um, are met um, and that there's this ongoing fragmentation um, among uh, the Arab masses and, and Arab working classes across the region. Um, to ensure that the autocratic states that we want to stay in power remain in power. And you cannot divorce all of this from Israel and Israel's project and um, um, settler colonialism. Thank you. Yara, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think Palestine and, and the Palestinian struggle for justice should take a natural place in socialist organizing and, and solidarity, you know, as a struggle against imperialism, racial capitalism, etc. We we can't allow for Palestine to be that exception in socialist or other leftist spaces because many of the 
culprits that are oppressing Palestinians are similarly oppressing others around the world. You know, the arms and security companies are really a perfect example of that. As I mentioned before, the the normalization deals with the Arab regimes were arms deals. Um, and I think this necess- necessitates, us to, necessitates us to think about a larger struggle, um, just as Samaya mentioned, um, not just regionally, but also globally. Um, and and this framing of Palestine as part of an internationalist and, and socialist package is, is important, not just for, for allies um, uh, and for, for international solidarity, but it's also important for Palestinians. I think there has to be a real reckoning with you know, the internal and domestic forces that help and exasperate our colonial condition. Uh, and very specifically, I'm talking about capitalist and patriarchal structures, which have moved us away from the collective towards individualism and, and personal gain, which is really the perfect situation for any colonial entity because the colonized become susceptible to corruption, collaboration, and, and the divisions within Palestinian society are further entrenched. It serves the the Israeli settler colonial regime very well to keep the Palestinian working classes, women and other marginalized groups doubly oppressed. You know, for example, we can't accept a millionaire Palestinian businessman who is apparently investing in Palestine when he does so in complete collaboration with the colonial state and at the expense of Palestinian working classes and Palestinian rural communities. And neither can we accept our leadership, the Palestinian leadership, allying themselves with despicable regimes, um, with capitalist interests, with U.S. imperialism, etc. So we need to hold our own accountable and we need to insist on a return to, to a revolutionary struggle that always, always allies itself with the people and with the streets. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. We are uh, nearing uh, the hour, and we promise to round up in an hour, so I'm afraid there will be no time for uh, uh, questions and answers. Um, uh, I think uh, we we all four of us, or five of us, (laughs) uh, agree uh, that the struggle for uh, social justice and for the liberation of Palestine needs to be part of a coalition that counters the coalition of neoliberalism, Zionism, and imperialism. They are, we don't, we cannot unpack that alliance because they are connected strategically, economically, ideologically, whether they work in Palestine or in the United States or in Africa. And therefore the struggle against it uh, has to be a, a joint struggle for social justice, which is also justice for uh, the colonized uh, uh, Palestinians. Uh, And hopefully we will also find, we will find the structure uh, and the organization to do it because socialist ideology without organization is like having, like like finding a very good source of water, but which needs to be uh, uh, transferred to another place, but there is a kind of uh, reluctance to use bottles. Uh, but if you only move the water with your hands, you will end up empty-handed. So if we don't like bottles, let, let's find another, other vessels uh, with which, or containers with which to, to, um, to <laughs> transfer the water, because eventually you will, we have to go back to some of the basic ideas they left had uh, left uh, uh, for us uh, or that has taught us in the past, which has to do with organizations, uh, both as as a movement, but also as bodies of organizations, uh, because otherwise I think the most beautiful revolutionary energy uh, might just be wasted and that would be a great pity. So, uh, I think we did all end in some sort of a hopeful uh, note uh, for the future role of the left in the liberation of Palestine and the future role of the left in Palestine. Thank you, uh, everyone. Um, uh, On my screen, all the organizers have gone to bed uh, and only the panelists have been left, which is fine. Uh, It's our first revolutionary act was to take over this panel uh, without any uh, organization, so I might be wrong about my uh, uh, plea for organization, 
you see, anarchistically it works as well. Uh, so good night. Oh, there's someone there from the powers that be. I'm glad to see that. So good night, everyone, and thank you very much. And uh, hope to see you soon in another fantastic webinar like this one. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>